Thank you very much, Dr. Goldenberg. Um, so this morning I'm going to talk about uh, biochemical recurrence post-radical prostatectomy. Uh, and just to define the objectives of the talk, it's to uh, define exactly what biochemical recurrence is, to describe its incidence and differential diagnosis, to identify factors uh, preoperatively and postoperatively that uh, are risk factors for biochemical recurrence, uh, most importantly to describe its natural history uh, and discuss various treatment options for it, as well as discuss uh, various adjuvant therapies that may uh, modify the risk of this happening. So what is a biochemical recurrence? Well, you're all familiar with uh, prostate-specific antigen, and this is a serine protease that is produced almost exclusively in the prostate gland. Sorry, uh, almost pr produced almost exclusively in the prostate gland. Um, and so theoretically, if the prostate cancer is confined to the prostate gland and all the prostate gland is removed, then the PSA should become undetectable. So this is the broadest definition of biochemical recurrence is, uh, is the presence of um, a detectable PSA indicating the presence of prostatic epithelial cells. And it was really on this basis that uh, the FDA originally approved PSA as a, as a marker uh, for monitoring uh, response to local therapy for prostate cancer. And PSA recurrence comes in two flavors, uh, PSA persistence and PSA recurrence. So PSA, PSA persistence is when the PSA never becomes undetectable after radical prostatectomy, and PSA recurrence is when it, it, it is initially undetectable and then becomes detectable, although there probably isn't any biological difference between an early PSA recurrence and primary PSA persistence. So how common is it? Well, there are two, almost a quarter of a million new cases of localized prostate cancer diagnosed between the US and, and Europe each year. And in Canada, there's almost 25,000 uh, new cases a year. And although, although there is some geographical variation, about 40% of patients choose radical prostatectomy as their primary treatment option. About 20 to 30% of those men who undergo radical prostatectomy will then develop recurrent disease. However, as I'll show a little later on, this is highly dependent on patient case mix, as well as the definition of biochemical recurrence. Just looking at uh, what happens here in Vancouver, on the prostate database here, we've got just over 2,000 patients recorded, of which follow-up uh, or detailed PSA follow-up is available for almost 1,500. And after mean follow-up of uh, five years, 320, or just over 20%, had developed a biochemical recurrence. Given that, the, that most of the patients, or a lot of the patients in the Vancouver database are intermediate slash high risk, these are very acceptable figures. So unlike biochemical recurrence post-radiotherapy, where there's a standard definition defining exactly what it is, there isn't one for uh, post-radical prostatectomy. And really, it can be any detectable PSA post-radical prostatectomy or detection after a previous period of absence. The half-life of PSA is relatively short at three to four days. So it really should be undetectable after five or six half-lives. So four weeks post-op, it should be undetectable. So what do we use it for? Well, it's got meaning for both the physician and for the patient. So firstly, for the physician, it's used to monitor the success of local therapy. So if we irradiate the prostate or take it out, we expect the PSA to, be, uh, to come down to a certain level. We also use it to monitor the long-term duration or success of our, of our treatment in that if the PSA begins to rise, it may be an early indication of recurrent disease and initiate the uh, uh, serve as an initiation point for instituting salvage therapy. And in the research literature, uh, biochemical recurrence is used as a surrogate endpoint for comparing different local treatment modalities, so comparing the efficacy of radical prostatectomy to brachytherapy to external beam radiotherapy. However, it's got a totally different meaning for the patient and is often the primary focus of the post-operative consultation. You know, what is my PSA? How is it doing? And so rather than, being con rather than being focused on the functional outcomes, patients are often more focused on what their blood level is. Um, and sort of in the more extreme uh, versions, this can, can border into sort of obsessive anxiety, a, a, a syndrome that's been called PSA dynia, which, you know, after spending a year in prostate clinic really is a real entity. So does it always mean that it's a recurrent cancer? Well, the answer to that is no. Um, one, of the, one of the things that uh, a low PSA or a slowly rising PSA is often ascribed to is the presence of um, residual um, benign glands left in the field, not to recurrent cancer. However, this, uh, I guess we've all have anecdotes of patients who, um, who we, we, we've seen that we've ascribed their PSA recurrence to this, and in fact, I've seen one patient after radical prostatectomy who had a slowly rising PSA, 
And on cystoscopy, he had a subtrigonal nodule, which was resected and turned out to be a BPH nodule. And his PSA went from detectable to undetectable, remained there for, for three or four years. Now, whether he, whether he also has some recurrent cancer, we can't tell. But, you know, that's certainly a, a case where uh, BPH caused a, a, an elevated PSA. However, it's an area that hasn't really been looked at systemically uh, in too many uh, studies. And here are two that I've, that I've identified, which are quite nice. This one looked at uh, just under 200 patients uh, who underwent, underwent radical prostatectomy for localized prostate cancer. And what they did was they, they, uh, they took whole man sections, uh, serial sections through the prostate gland, and basically looked at the margin of the gland for the presence of benign epithelial cells. And what you can see here is that up to a third of patients had benign glands at the edge of their uh, resection margin that were transected or, or, or just opposed to the, uh, to the margin. And as you'd expect, um, the areas where these occurred were areas where the prostate capsule was deficient, namely the bladder neck and the apex. However, there was no association with any of the tumor variables. And using a, a relatively um, non-stringent stringent definition of biochemical recurrence of a, of a single PSA greater than or equal to 0 0.1, uh, with a median follow-up of 12 months, which is probably too short, uh, they found no association with uh, PSA recurrence. Um, perhaps a more interesting study is this one from Germany, uh, which was a prospective study looking at over 800 patients. Uh, and in, in this series, what they did was they, when they performed the radical prostatectomy and divided the apex and transected the urethra, the surgeons then took multiple biopsies of the periurethral peri tissue on the distal side, so the side that's remaining, and then sent those biopsies separately for histological analysis. And as you can see here, this is the important figure, almost three quarters of patients had residual benign glands distal to the point of transection. So, you know, residual benign glands are very, very common. Um, and in terms of the technical aspects of the surgery, they found that there was a, an association, although it was a small association, with the, the performance of a neurosparing procedure. So if you were, had a neurosparing procedure, you were more likely to be left with residual benign glands. Um, However, with a, using a fairly stringent definition of a single uh, PSA rise above 0 0.5, with a mean follow-up of 48 months, they didn't find any significant difference in, in biochemical recurrence. So certainly combining these two studies, although there may be anecdotal evidence of uh, BPH causing elevated PSA, it doesn't seem to be a systemic or common phenomenon. Um, one thing, though, that has been shown to, to interfere with PSA assays after um, or indeed before radical prostatectomy is the appearance of heterophilic interfering antibodies. And these are anti-mouse or anti-rabbit antibodies that develop in the human host for some reason or whatsoever. Um, but they interfere with the, the specific PSA assay. And so you may get a positive result, which, uh, which is a false positive. And there are numerous case reports of patients having a elevated PSA post-radical uh, prostatectomy, then undergoing salvage treatment either with radiotherapy or hormonal therapy, the PSA being repeated, it not budging or in fact even increasing, and they repeated the assay on a, uh, on a separate or different assay uh, and showed that the PSA was undetectable. So if, if the recurrence doesn't quite fit the biology of the cancer that you see in the radical prostatectomy, then it's probably not right. So if a guy has a PSA, um, so if, if a guy undergoes a radical prostatectomy, has a, has a low risk, low volume prostate cancer, yet comes back at three months and his PSA is three, it's probably not right. And the first thing you should do is just check it on a separate assay. So can we predict preoperatively who will get a biochemical recurrence? And the answer is, yeah, we can, we can, we can tell pretty accurately who, who's going to get it or not. Uh, and a lot of this work was done by Tony D'Amico from, from Boston. He's published quite extensively on risk profiling patients, both preoperatively and postoperatively, uh, to predict disease recurrence. Um, and we're all familiar with the D'Amico, or we should all be familiar with the, the D'Amico risk classification. This is the one that we tend to use clinically uh, when counseling patients on their treatment options and natural history of their disease. Um, and he basically divides patients into, into risk categories, so low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk based on three variables, their preoperative PSA, their biopsy Gleason score, and their clinical stage. And as you can see here, so patients with low risk, so there are those with a, an impalpable prostate cancer, a uh, biopsy score of six or less, uh, and a PSA of uh, less than 10, their risk of recurrence at 10 years is only about 
If you contrast this then with the high-risk prostate cancer patients, and they're guys with a, a PSA greater than 20, locally advanced disease, or Gleason score 8, 9, or 10 on biopsy, their risk of recurrence is in the order of, four, uh, risk of, recurrence in the order of 50 to 60 percent at, uh, at 10 years. Um, and a number of other preoperative and postoperative factors have been identified that predict recurrence, such as PSA kinetics, such as the PSA doubling time beforehand, and the PSA velocity. The amount of cancer on the biopsy, so the number of cores involved and percentage of each core. And then postoperatively, uh, you also get some more pathological information that refines your risk categorization, such as their tumor stage, tumor grade, margin status, uh, tumor characteristics, whether it's peripheral or transitional, whether it's unifocal or multifocal, maximum diameter, etc., uh, as well as a number of different molecular markers. However, you can't, you know, we as surgeons, we can't change the tumor grade, we can't change the tumor stage. Um, all we can do, from what I can see, is we can either change their margin status or we can change the number of lymph nodes that we take out. So does, is that important? Um, well, it is. Uh, and the largest study to look at this came out of uh, Memorial Stone Kettering with, um, uh, with Vickers et al. And they looked at uh, almost 8,000 patients who were treated by 72 different surgeons at four large US centers, MSK, Baylor, Wayne State, and Cleveland. And they divided patients recurrent, patient recurrence rates by the number of prior prostatectomies performed by, uh, by the surgeons. So surgeons were ranked according to their experience, those with greater than 1,000, and then in descending order to less than 50 prior cases performed. And as you can see here, there's a clear association, clear and significant association between um, prostatectomy experience and recurrence rates. Um, when they analyzed at what point did surgical experience become less important in determining recurrence rates? That inflection point occurred at, at about the 250 mark. So up to 250 cases, um, patient recurrence rates continued to decline, but at, at, at that point, it started to plateau. Uh, and this is what they, what they then suggested was the learning curve for radical prostatectomy, that you need to perform 250 cases before you have reached your, your, your plateau uh, in, in, in patient recurrence. Um, and when they looked at the variables that were affected by patient experience, the main one that seemed to be significant was the positive surgical margin rate, um, which is quite intuitive. Um, overall, patients with, who were less experienced had a 1.6 times uh, the rate of positive margins compared to, patient, to, compared to surgeons who were more experienced. And interestingly, this effect was greater for organ-confined disease uh, rather than non-organ-confined disease. And I, I assume, or the assumption is made, is that uh, this is because the nerve sp a nerve spur was attempted in these patients and an iatrogenic capsular incision was made and, and margin rate went up. What is important, though, is that the, the strength of the surgeon effect, so what the individual surgeon brings to the table, is of similar magnitude to that of Gleason grade and tumor stage, which is sobering, a sobering thought. However, surgical experience is not enough. Um, when they looked at the 54 most experienced surgeons, and to be experienced for this study, you had to have a minimum of 40 or, or more prior cases. Again, they looked at PSA recurrence and, 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 con and corrected the analysis for tumor stage and tumor grade, so control for the important biological variables. There was still considerable variability amongst individual surgeons. So even amongst experienced surgeons, um, there was quite a marked variability, up to a 30% difference in, 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 in recurrence rates. So, you know, if I was a prostate cancer patient, I, I'd certainly be, you know, I'd be advocating choose, choosing your surgeon carefully. So does a biochemical recurrence matter? And this, um, this boils down to two of the challenges of defining biochemical recurrence post-radical prostatectomy. One is specificity and one is sensitivity. So to be specific, it must tell us something that's relevant about the natural history of the disease. So it's got to predict something that's clinically meaningful, either metastasis or death. And to be sensitive, it's got to identify those patients at an early enough stage that institution of salvage therapy at that point is most likely to be effective. Um, as I said at the start, the incidence and indeed the behavior of biochemical recurrence really depends on where you put your threshold for defining uh, a recurrence or not. 
And this was a, a very nice paper uh, by Amling and colleagues which uh, first explored this issue and they looked at almost 3,000 patients with clinically localized prostate cancer and they looked at what does a change in the cut point of the definition do to both the incidence of, incidence of biochemical recurrence as well as the future natural behavior of that PSA recurrence. And what they found was if they used a, an endpoint of or a PSA recurrence of greater than 0.2, uh, compared to a, a, a recurrence rate of 0 0.5, at five years, there was a 20% absolute difference in the incidence of biochemical recurrence. So simply changing your definition can change your outcomes dramatically. However, this is the, this is the, the figure that's, uh, you know, that's most interesting. When they looked at patients with a cutoff of between 0 0.2 and 0 0.29 and looked at what happened after that, so did their PSA go down, did it go up, did it stay the same, only half of the patients who make that cutoff continued to progress. Half of them didn't or went down. When they looked at a cutoff of 0.4, almost three quarters or 75% continued to increase, whereas 25% didn't. And this sort of feeds back into, into our definitions. Um, you know, our definitions post radical prostatectomy tend to favor sensitivity over specificity. So we're very good at picking up early all those guys who will recur. However, most of the guys who make the definition will never recur clinically or, um, or in a meaningful way. So there are a plethora of definitions out there, either based on you know, a single cut point, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, a, a single cut point plus a, a second or a confirmatory rise, so either the same or rising, again using a cut point of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or 0 0.4, or one that's not particularly threshold-based but looks at the change in PSA over time, so two successive rises or three successive rises. So which one should we use? So this study by Stevenson et al. looked at, uh, looked at exactly this issue. Uh, and they looked at a cohort of just over 3,000 men um, who, as you can see here, were predominantly low-slash-intermediate risk disease. Um, and after a mean follow-up of uh, 49 months, 75 patients out of the total cohort of 3,000 had developed metastatic disease. They then went back and associated the, um, the degree of correlation between the different definitions of biochemical recurrence and the development of metastatic disease to see how specific, excuse me, to see how specific they were and to judge the performance characteristics of each one. And basically what they found was that the best definition that they looked at at predicting a meaningful clinical outcome, in this case metastatic disease, was a single reading of PSA uh, of greater than equal or equal to 0 0.4, which is then subsequently confirmed on a, second, uh, on a second reading. However, if you look at the correlation statistic, it's very weak. Okay, so again, even though this might be the best and most specific one we have, overall it's not very specific at all. Okay. And what are the problems then with using this definition or using any of the definitions is that, you know, even with a if we use the standardized definition, unqualified biochemical recurrence doesn't really predict outcome. It's sensitive. We pick up all the guys who will recur, but it's not specific in that most of the guys we do pick up will never recur. Um, and this is a very nice illustration of the point. Um, and this was a study looking at just over 1,000 patients of which 20% developed a biochemical recurrence, in this case defined as a PSA of, a single PSA of greater than or equal to 0 0.2. And the outcome of this study was overall survival. Um, and after a mean follow-up of uh, 56 months, um, they looked at overall survival between the, between, uh, the groups, groups who had developed biochemical recurrence and weren't treated between groups who developed biochemical recurrence and was treated with salvage radiotherapy or hormonal therapy, and patients who didn't develop a biochemical recurrence. And as you can see here, out to about six years, there's no difference in overall survival. Exactly. What do you mean by sensitive then? I understand that they're not specific. Yeah. So every patient who will develop a clinically significant event down the track, we will pick up with a early in the, with a low PSA threshold. But not everybody that we pick up, you know, the vast majority that we pick up will not go on to develop a clinically significant event. So we capture 100% of our recurrences early. Unfortunately, of all the patients that we pick up, only 15% to 30, 15 to 30%, depending on what you look at, will actually go on to develop a clinically significant event.
Now, obviously, that depends on the age in which they were diagnosed, their comorbid status, the time from radical prostatectomy to recurrence. There's all different factors. But the point is, and this is particularly germane to comparing radiotherapy versus surgery, is with the ASTRA definition, I'll get, get onto this a little later on, the ASTRA definition is based on specificity, not sensitivity. So they deliberately chose a definition that predicted a meaningful outcome. In their case, it was development of metastasis and death. So they, they will not pick up all their, in fact, it's very poor at picking up all their patients early in their, in their recurrence, but they're very specific for the event, whereas we're very sensitive, but it doesn't have much specificity at all. Um, and this point is underscored, uh, you know, the reason why uh, there's no difference in overall survival is that really a minority of patients who develop a biochemical recurrence, treated or untreated, will either develop metastasis or, or die from their disease. Um, and the biggest study to, to look at this issue has just been recently published in European Urology. And from a cohort of almost 15,000 patients, they looked at uh, the, the, the clinical behavior or natural history of just under 2,500 patients who developed biochemical recurrence. And as you can see here, there, after a median follow-up of 6.6 uh, .6 years, 11% or just under 12% had progressed, 22% had died from all causes, but just under 6% had died from prostate cancer. So if you translate that into the actuarial projection curves or survival curves, of the whole whole number of patients who recurred, the 15-year progression-free survival is 76%. So only 26% of guys will develop a problem or develop progression over 15 years. And similarly, only 16.4% of patients will die from their prostate cancer over 15 years. So that's long follow-up, long time, not many people developing metastasis or death. And this is really consistent across a number of studies with various degrees of follow-up, but some of them very long, out to 20 years in some cases, that of patients who develop biochemical recurrence, depending on what definition you use, only 13 to 36 percent of patients will demonstrate clinical progression, so will develop metastasis, and only 1.1 to 14 percent will die of their disease, even with prolonged follow-up. So, as I said, as I said at the start, one of the things that we tend to use biochemical recurrence for is a surrogate endpoint for comparing different local treatments, be it brachytherapy versus radiotherapy versus uh, radical surgery. Um, well, is this valid? Um, as I've discussed, radical prostatectomy or the various definitions prioritize sensitivity over specificity. Uh, but when Astra met oh, about six years ago now to redefine what constituted a, uh, a a definition of biochemical recurrence plus radiotherapy and came up with their Nadir plus two definition. So um, a PSA that's greater than two nanograms per mil over the Nadir PSA post-radiation is what the radio radiation oncologists consider as a biochemical recurrence. Um, they chose specificity over sensitivity. So the vast majority of guys who had this definition or met this definition or qualified under this definition went on to develop a problem. So either metastasis or death. Um, the effect that the, two, that the different test characteristics have on the various definitions is, is shown in this very nice study, which looked at uh, 2,570 men who were treated with radical prostatectomy for uh, clinically localized disease with a, with a mean follow-up of 6.2 years. And they compared what happens if we apply the ASTRA definition compared to a standard definition of greater than 2 nanograms per mil. And what you can see here is that the ASTRA definition at all time points consistently underestimates the number of patients who would be defined by the surgical definition um, as recurs. So the, the, if you compare the ASTRO versus the surgical one, ASTRO, using the ASTRO characteristic, it always seems life is rosier. Less patients recur. Um, if you take those guys who just develop metastatic disease and die, so they are two very relevant clinical endpoints and compare the two definitions, what you can see here is that the surgical definition will predict recurrence about five years before the ASTRA definition does. So there's a lag time with the ASTRA definition, okay? And that's, that comes down to the sensitivity and the sensitivity of the, rat, of the radical prostatectomy definition versus the specificity of the uh, ASTRA definition. Um, and this time delay of five years means that when you're comparing outcome data of radiotherapy versus 
uh, radical prostatectomy. To correct for that, you really should be comparing 10-year radiation data with five-year surgical data, although most theories tend to look at equal times. So just in summary, um, for every 100 men who undergo radical prostatectomy, 15 to 30 will develop a biochemical recurrence, 5 to 10 will develop a clinical progression, usually metastasis, and 2 to 6 will die of their disease. So can we predict those who will behave badly? Um, the first study to address this came out of John Hopkins, and they looked at, at a cohort of 304 patients with biochemical recurrence uh, being defined as a PSA of greater than 0.2 nanograms per mil, and looked at the natural history of that disease. And basically what they found, and this was always a very interesting statistic when I first read it a number of years ago, was that the median time from developing biochemical recurrence to the development of metastatic disease is eight years. So it takes a long time. So even if you develop biochemical recurrence now, it could be eight years before you, um, before you develop a problem. Um, what they also showed was that the biggest predictor of cancer-specific death is the time's metastasis. So if you've got a short time to metastasis, you're more likely to die of prostate cancer. If you've got a long time to metastasis, then you're less likely to die of prostate cancer. And this may reflect a more internal biology of the disease or more likely increasing comorbidities as you age. But it, it, it really did validate time to metastasis or the development of metastasis as, as the probably the most relevant clinical endpoint uh, to look at for local therapies. And what they found was um, they looked at different factors that predicted whether you developed metastasis or not. And they came up with three things. One was the Gleason score. So when they, when they looked at guys with high-grade disease, Gleason score 8 to 10 versus those with lower intermediate risk disease, they were much more likely to develop metastasis at a, at a much higher rate. Time to better biochemical recurrence. In this study, uh, if you developed it within two years after your surgery, you're much more likely to develop a problem than if you developed it greater than two years. And then PSA doubling time, which is a measure of how fast the PSA increases. And if you had a doubling time of less than 10, 10 months, uh, you were much more likely to develop a problem than if you, uh, if you had a PSA of greater than 10 months. And this, this really does make sense in that if PSA is linearly related to the number of cells you have, the faster your cancer grows, the faster your PSA increases. Um, these study, this study was then uh, subsequently updated and refined uh, in 2005. Um, and what they showed here uh, in an expanded cohort of patients of 379 is that PSA doubling time isn't a simple threshold. It's not less than six months, more than six months, less than 10 months, greater than 10 months. It's really a continuum of risk. Um, and they looked at, they, they batched doubling times into uh, sort of a six or seven different cohorts, with the smallest one being less than three months and the longest one being greater than 24 months, and about six, six different categories in between. Um, and using cancer-specific survival as an outcome, they showed that there was a, uh, an increasing association with time to death or rate of death with decreasing PSA doubling time. So over, over a fairly broad spectrum, the faster your PSA doubles post-radical prostatectomy, the more likely you are to die from your disease. I guess the important thing here is that the magnitude of, of, of the effect is inversely related to the doubling time. So the smaller your doubling time, the bigger the effect. Again, they confirmed that time to biochemical recurrence and pathological Gleason score were also important predictors. Um, se separate studies have looked at this issue and have confirmed that PSA doubling time is the main thing that, that, that predicts outcome, whether it be metastasis, free survival, uh, again, overall survival, um, you know, PSA, the shorter your PSA doubling time, the more likely you are to develop metastasis, to die from your prostate cancer, and to die of all causes. Um, and this is confirmed across multiple studies. Um, one of the things that was identified early on was that time to biochemical recurrence seemed to be an important issue. So whether you recurred within two years of your surgery or within three years of your surgery seemed to predict a worse outcome. And, and it was often on the basis of this that the the criteria for judging whether a guy would go on to salvage therapy, one of the important considerations was, one of the important considerations was, when did his PSA recur? Was it soon after his surgery or late down the track? Um, 
This, this has been re-looked at quite recently in that large study that I mentioned originally with the 2,500 patients. And basically what they did was they, they looked at time to biochemical recurrence over a, a broad spectrum of time, so less than 1.2 years out to greater than 5.9 years and, and a few different categories in between, and associated them with either metastasis or cancer-specific survival. What they showed was that although time to recurrence was significantly associated with the development of metastasis, it didn't predict prostate cancer-specific survival. When they looked at this, the reason for this was not because the cancer was any less aggressive or more indolent or behaved more like a local recurrence rather than a systemic recurrence. It was that the further on down the track you got from the radical prostatectomy, the more likely you were to die from non-cancer-related causes because you were older, you had more comorbidities. So this idea or this concept that we used to have, and I used to have that if you recurred late, then your cancer was either you know, a bit more indolent or more successful local recurrence, doesn't look like it's correct. And when they put it into their multivariate analysis, they showed time to recurrence had absolutely no bearing on whether, uh, on, on, on whether you die from your prostate cancer. So one of the interesting things about PSA kinetics post-treatment uh, is that it's actually generalizable. It doesn't just follow, it, it doesn't just predict after surgery, it actually predicts after radiotherapy too. And this was another study by D'Amico that looked at PSA doubling time either following radical prostatectomy or following external beam radiotherapy in fairly large cohorts. And using a definition of uh, a rapid PSA doubling time of less than three months or greater than three months, what they found that with both radiotherapy and surgery, having a rapid PSA doubling time predicted both, cancer, both prostate cancer-specific survival and overall survival for both surgery and radiotherapy. So it seems to have the same utility regardless of the treatment modality that's used. So as I said, we can predict relatively accurately who will develop a biochemical recurrence overall, but can we predict those who will develop a significant biochemical recurrence, that is a biochemical recurrence with a PSA doubling time that's of some significance or of some relevance? And again, it was D'Amico who looked at this, and he identified two factors that predicted a, a, a PSA recurrence with a doubling time less than three months, and that was your PSA velocity, so what happened to your PSA in the year that you were diagnosed with prostate cancer. And if you had a PSA rise of greater than two nanograms per mil in the year in which you were diagnosed, you're much more likely to develop a significant recurrence postoperatively. And of course, if you had poorly differentiated disease on your biopsy, you're more likely to develop a, a recurrence. And similarly, looking at patients who will either not develop a recurrence or develop a recurrence that's probably not biologically significant, if your PSA had only been slowly rising in the year beforehand, if you've got low-grade disease on your biopsy and your PSA is low and your clinical stage is low, then you're unlikely to develop a, either a recurrence ab initio or, or, or in total or a significant recurrence. There are problems with using PSA doubling time as a predictive tool, and that's because only 10 to 15 percent of patients with biochemical recurrence actually have a biochemical recurrence doubling time of less than three months. And in fact, the majority of men who die from prostate cancer have a PSA doubling time greater than this. Um, and so there have been a number of nomograms and algorithms based on PSA doubling time, Gleason score, and time to recurrence, which more accurately allow the clinician to identify or predict those patients who will either develop metastasis or will go on to die from their prostate cancer. And, you know, these can be useful clinically in counseling patients about their natu the natural history of their disease and the various treatment options available to them. Um, what about ultra-sensitive PSA? So ultra-sensitive PSAs are PSAs with a, with a detection range that falls well below that of traditional assays. Um, and these have been around for about 15 years uh, and are used, used a lot in private laboratories. And in fact, they continue to be developed. And the, and the last one that I saw that was developed was back in 2009. And these were using gold nanoparticles to which PSA antibodies had been conjugated and using it what's called um, biobarcode technology, which I don't understand, uh, to detect very, very low levels of PSA. And using this assay, they're able to detect down to a lower limit of 330 femtograms per mil. And just to put that into context, that's four orders of magnitude below a standard assay of 0.2. So what's the problem with ultrasensitive PSAs? Well, I think if you, if you look at a couple of the clinical cases that they showed in this paper, you'll see some of the difficulties. And the top one here is a PSA recur, and this is his ultrasensitive PSA before he develops, before he enters into the, into the 
sensitivity of the traditional assay. Uh, and this is that view magnified. Sorry, I've lost my cursor. And this is that view magnified. And, and when you look at it, you go, that's great. You can see that he's rising in the ultra sensitive range and then he hits the threshold and he continues to go. This, this is great. We'll be able to identify all the guys who developed a, a problem. However, if you look at the non recurs I would challenge you to differentiate between this guy who is a non recurrer and this early part of the PSA recur. You can't. And similarly, this is another non recurrer and his PSA on the ultrasensitive range just goes up and down, up and down. What does it mean? Um, one of the useful things of ultrasensitive PSA is that if it's negative, it's good. So if it's positive, it doesn't tell you very much, but if it's negative, it's good. So if you have an undetectable PS, ultra-sensitive PSA, it predicts freedom from standard biochemical recurrence. And this has been shown in a, in a nice study of 384 patients who, had, who were greater than two years post-radical prostatectomy, and they were categorized based on the nadir value of their ultra-sensitive PSA assay. So are they below the detection level of the, of the assay or various levels up to greater than 0.5 uh, nanograms per mil? And the outcome here was a traditional definition of PSA recurrence. And what they found was that if you had, if your PSA in a deer was below the lower limit detection level of the ultra-sensitive assay, then your chance of developing a significant biochemical recurrence or any biochemical recurrence was negligible. Um, as I alluded to, the main problem with, uh, with the ultra-sensitive assay is, is background noise. And it's here, I think, that BPH probably pays, uh, plays a bigger role. The other problem is, is that ultra-sensitive PSA kinetics, so the doubling time in the ultra-sensitive range, doesn't correlate in any way, shape, or form with the standard uh, PSA doubling times. So where is the recurrence? Um, the patterns of disease recurrence are basically based on the response to salvage therapy. And it's thought that local only recurrence occurs in only about 10 to 30 percent of patients. Combined local and systemic recurrence occurs in about 20 to 30 percent of patients, and the remainder are just distant failures. So, investigate. So, it would always be good if you knew where the disease was and you could design your treatment around it. And so, a number of imaging modalities have been looked at or, 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 or assessed for the ability to tell you where the disease is. But straight off the bat, I can tell you two investigations that have no utility. That's trust, trust and biopsy, basically because a positive biopsy doesn't rule out. Uh, metastatic disease, and likewise, a negative biopsy doesn't rule out negative rec local recurrence, as well as conventional CT, which has uh, has just su such low sensitivity. Probably the, investi probably the investigation we use most clinically is a bone scan, um, and this was a nice study looking at 239 patients with biochemical recurrence, of whom um, looking at clinical predictors of a positive bone scan. And in their study, 60, 60 patients, or just over 15, or just under 15% of patients, developed a, a positive bone scan in their series. And what they found was is that the higher your PSA, or the, the more rapid your PSA was increasing, the more likely you were to have a positive bone scan, as well as the trigger point, or the trigger PSA at which you did the bone scan. So the higher the PSA that you did the bone scan at, the more likely it was to be positive. And just to put that into context, if you look at the various PSA ranges at which uh, the bone scan was positive, in the 0 to 10 range, only 4% of, of, of bone scans were positive. Greater than a PSA of 50, almost 80% were positive. So in this range where we're considering salvage therapy in the 0 to 10 range, bone scan is usually of little, little, little utility. Probably the best investigation for local recurrence is an MRI. Uh, and that's really because it's got very good soft tissue discrimination, particularly in the pelvis. However, conventional MRI itself lacks sensitivity and specificity. However, there have been a number of protocols that have been investigated both in the, um, the pre-radical prostatectomy arena as well as post-radical prostatectomy looking for ro local recurrence that shows some promise. Uh, these include dynamic contrast enhancement, and you can see here that uh, you've got a nodule here that increases in, in enhancement with the administra administration of contrast as well as diffusion-weighted imaging. Um, at the moment, they're not quite ready for, for, for prime time, as they say. One of the difficulties with conventional morphological imaging is that you need a lump to see. You need something there that you can differentiate between normal tissue and abnormal tissue. That's not, the, that's not true with PET or PET-CT, because that relies on cellular metabolism rather than any morphological differences. And so you can, you can get amplification of the signal, and you can see small recurrences that are morphologically indistinguishable from the surrounding tissue. 
Um, in the last five years since I looked at PET, there's been a number of changes. First of all, there's been a move away from using glucose as the tracer to use, using choline, and this is because prostate cancer metabolism of glucose tends not to be increased, whereas choline metabolism tends to be up. Uh, there's been a shift away from radio-labeled fluorine to radio-labeled carbon, and this is because fluorine tends to be excreted in the urinary tract and can obscure uh, areas that are important for urological cancers. The only problem with radio-labeled carbon is that you actually need a synchrotron nearby, and not many hospitals have that available to them. Um, there's been some very promising data with, uh, uh, with radio-labeled fluoride for detecting bone metastasis, and there's a number of papers indicating that this may be more sensitive than uh, standard um, bone scintigraphy. And there's also been a push or a move towards combining PET data with, uh, with CT data um, for anatomical localization, and this improves the, um, the specificity of, it, of the test. However, if you, if you look at the sensitivity of these assays or of these investigations in the biochemical recurrence arena, it's still very variable. So somewhere between 45 to 80 percent sensitivity. So although the data is promising, it's not quite there yet. Um, what about SPECT and SPECT-CT? So these are uh, imaging modalities that are based on the use of radio-labeled antibodies. The one that's most commonly used is prostacent, and it's been FDA approved for the detection of metastasis in patients with, with uh, prostate cancer. Now, pro prostacent never took off in Australia. Um, I don't think it ever took off in Ireland. Did it ever take off in Canada? Um, and you don't, you don't read too much about it anymore. And part of the problem with prostacent is that you've got a very high inter-observer variability. So two guys look at the same scan, differ more times than not. Uh, the other problem with uh, the Caprimab antibody is that it binds to PSMA uh, when it's internalized into the cell. So in, it, it will pick up necrotic cells and apoptotic cells. It's not specific for viable cancer cells. So where are we heading towards? We're really heading towards a radiologist's wet dream, and that's using multiple different imaging modalities with multiple specific tracers looking for different things. So we'll have a different different imaging modality for looking for local recurrence, a different imaging modality looking for um, regional recurrence, and a different one altogether looking for, um, for systemic recurrence. There is a push to develop uh, MRI PET, which is, com which is combining PET with MRI. Um, there's also a number of novel tracers. Probably the most interesting one is the use of uh, fluorolabeled dihydrotestosterone. Um, for functional studies of uh, prostate cancer metabolism. So what about salvage therapy? Um, so who are good patients for salvage? Well, these are guys who have a high probability of local only recurrence. They've got a reasonable long life expectancy, again, greater than 10 years, and they've got no metastasis that you can see on imaging, although, as we mentioned, this is of low utility. How do we predict those guys who will not do well with local therapy or who local therapy is probably overkill for. Well, um, that really depends on your a priori risk of METs at the time of initial treatment, and they're all the things that I mentioned before, your grade, your stage, nodal status, et cetera, as well as your post-treatment PSA kinetics. So good candidates for salvage therapy are those with low or intermediate risk disease at the time of presentation, those with radical prostatectomy pathology that's suggestive of local recurrence. So they've got no high-risk features, so their Gleason score is equal or less than Gleason 7. They've got no seminal vesicle invasion, and they're margin positive. And they've got post-therapy PSA kinetics that are, that are consistent with a local-only failure. So uh, they've got a relatively long PSA doubling time, uh, and the time to PSA recurrence may be prolonged, although this is probably not that important. I guess the, the most important thing, though, is that they're is their absolute PSA at the time that you salvage. So ideally, it should be less than one, and they should have a life expectancy of greater than 10 years. Uh, in contrast, if you take everything that I said there and reverse it, you've got those guys who are poor candidates for salvage. So advanced disease, short interval to PSA uh, failure, and a rapid PSA doubling time. Probably the most important thing in predicting those guys who will do well after salvage is the PSA at the time of treatment. Okay, and this has been shown in a number of studies using a number of different thresholds. So the higher the PSA at which you institute salvage therapy, the worse your outcome is going to be. Okay? It's not clearly defined yet what is the optimum upper limit of this threshold, but it's probably in the order of 1 to 1.5, although some studies suggest that uh, it could be as low as 0 0.5. How do you do it? Um, it's usually given either as four-field 3D conformal radiotherapy or IMRT. It's given to a dose of 64 to 70 gray. The target volume includes the prostatic bed as well as the seminal vesicle remnants if present. 
Um, currently, it's unknown whether whole pelvis irradiation, that includes the, the lymph glands, is better than uh, local therapy alone. Uh, and there's accumulating evidence that giving it in combination with androgen deprivation therapy as a radiosensitizer is, is beneficial. Uh, prognostic factors are, as, uh, as mentioned there and as was previously described, probably the only technical one is the radiation dose. So like most radiotherapies, the less you give, the less it works. And the critical threshold seems to be 65 gray. In comparison to primary radiation treatment, it tends to be fairly well tolerated. Um, probably the biggest issue is with erectile dysfunction, in that it'll increase erectile dysfunction in about, a, in a, in about 30 percent more patients than radical prostatectomy alone. How successful, of it, how successful is it? Well, this was a study uh, looking at over 1,600 patients who were treated with uh, salvage radiotherapy across 17 institutions, and they used a, a biochemical recurrence endpoint of a PSA of greater than 0.2 nanograms per mil above post-radiotherapy to deer as their definition of, of failure. And what they found was is that at six years, about a third of patients had sustained response to local radiotherapy or local salvage radiotherapy. Um, what they also showed was that the, the, the absolute success depended on what threshold you use. So they saw a big difference between uh, treating at a, at a PSA of less than 0.5 to, say, com comparing it to those who were treated after uh, with a PSA of greater than 1.5. This is relatively consistent across studies in that salvage rate therapy has a, you know, 35 to 60 percent success rate depending on the PSA that you use and the, the time you follow up. So important thing is we know the guys who are going to do badly from the start. Can we modify their risk of recurrence after radical prostatectomy? Um, and there's been three large trials looking at adjuvant radiotherapy in high-risk patients. Probably the best of the three is the BOLA study, which was published in Lancet uh, about six years ago now. This was a randomized controlled trial comparing immediate adjuvant radiotherapy to the prostatic bed up to a dose of 60 gray compared to watchful waiting, just observing these guys in high-risk patients. And high-risk patients were described as uh, either extracapsular extension, seminal vesicle invasion, or positive surgical margin. After a median follow-up of five years, they found that immediate adjuvant radiotherapy reduced, resulted in an a absolute difference of 20% in your biochemical recurrence rate. So those who were treated with adjuvant therapy immediately had a, had a biochemical recurrence rate of 74%, whereas those who had a delayed watch-and-see policy or wait-and-see policy had a recurrence rate of 52%. Um, they also noted a smaller but significant difference in what's called clinical progression, and in this study, was, clinical progression was defined as an abnormal digital rectal exam. However, there are concerns with this study, and the biggest one is that 50% of men who were treated didn't need treatment, because this was the number of men in the Wait and Watch series who didn't develop a biochemical recurrence. 25% of men who were treated didn't get any benefit, they still recurred. There was no improvement in metastasis-free survival or overall survival with greater than 10 years median follow-up, and this was data presented at the EAU this year. So although biochemical recurrence is affected, there's no effect on the clinically meaningful things, metastasis and death. Um, although toxicity was reported to be mild, any patient with significant toxicity post-radical prostatectomy was automatically excluded. Um, and in the other problem was is that there was no protocol for relapse. So, Patients who failed, there was no protocol about when to treat them, how to treat them, where to treat them. It was up to the patient's individual treating physician. And in a subsequent analysis after a centralized pathological review of more than half the cases, although it was originally reported that all patients benefited, in the subsequent analysis, only patients with positive margins benefited. So not all high-risk patients benefit. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip to, through the two remaining trials, but they basically show essentially the same thing. So what are the arguments in favor of adjuvant radiotherapy? Well, proponents say most guys who recur, recur in the prostatic fossa. And if you leave local recurrence alone, it's going to de-differentiate and spread all over the place. Arguments in favor of salvage radiotherapy are that half of men who are treated with adjuvant radiotherapy are treated unnecessarily because they're never going to develop the recurrence. Salvage rates, you know, if we wait and see and pick out those guys who are going to fail, if we treat them appropriately at an appropriate time with a relatively low PSA, the response rates are going to be very good anyway. Um, and we know from the natural history that progression to distant metastasis and death, even after biochemical recurrence, can be very long. And depending on the age of the patient, it may be an irrelevant outcome anyway. So, you know, which is better? Well, we don't have any randomized control data to guide us just yet. 
Um, but there have been a number of studies that have tried to closely match two cohorts, one that received adjuvant radiotherapy, one that received salvage radiotherapy. And this is one of them. They looked at uh, just under 200 patients um, that were closely matched for PSA, Gleason score, semi visa invasion, margin status, all the rest of it. And basically what they showed was is that patients who, treat, who were treated with immediate adjuvant radiotherapy had a lower biochemical recurrence rate than those treated with salvage. A number of problems with this study. It's retrospective. Um, it included, PS, it included salvage patients who had a PSA of greater than 1.5 and probably weren't appropriately treated at that time. And, of, and probably most importantly is of the patients treated with uh, adjuvant radiotherapy, only half of them would have developed a recurrence by the Catan nomogram. So it's including, you know, 50% of recurs in the adjuvant therapy group versus guys that you know have already recurred in the salvage group. So it's not a, an appropriately balanced or controlled situation. So this is a nice way of looking at it, and this is a slide that I got from Dr. Goldenberg a couple of days ago. Um, and this is based on the figures shown from the ERTC, or that BOLA study, uh, and broken down into what happens to, to 100 men. And so if you take 100 men with high-risk disease, and you treat them with immediate adjuvant radiotherapy, as they did in the ERTC study, after five years, 75 men will be free of disease. Okay? If you don't, and if you don't treat them, and you apply the figures from the watch, watch and wait group, 53 will be free of disease, but 45, 47 will, be, will have a PSA recurrence. If you treat those 47 patients with early salvage therapy, you can expect about a 50% response. So 23 will respond, whereas 24 will fail. So if you add up the 53 and the 23, so those guys who are salvaged or will never recur, the total number is 76, which is one better than what you achieve with immediate adjunct radiotherapy, which you've only rated half of patients and your toxicity is going to be less. And these guys here who fail are probably destined to fail anyway. They're, they're, their disease is systemic at the very start, and the addition of local therapy is not going to be uh, useful. There is a large trial that's looking at this question, whether salvage radiotherapy is better than adjuvant radiotherapy. This is a 4,000 men multi-institute, multinational trial. It's going to take a decade or more to report. It makes sense that if a lot of disease is systemic, then maybe we should be looking at systemic therapies. Uh, and there are a number of randomized trials, various phase two or phase three trials that are looking at this, either with uh, angiogen deprivation, pomegranate extract, or combining angiogen deprivation with docetaxel in patients with who are asymptomatic and have a rising PSA after uh, radical prostatectomy. So thank you. Thank you.